love the life and ministry of Jesus and what it teaches us as his people through it. Uh, fourth one there, they are not written as chronological history, though they are historical, 100%, and there is chronology in them. Uh, that's not their main purpose, okay? Fifth one, they are the preaching of Jesus and about Jesus in written form, his very words. And then finally, what are the focal points of all four Gospels? His death and resurrection. His death and resurrection are the pinnacle of all four where they are all leading in their own way. So where does it want us to put our focus, our emphasis, our attention? The death and resurrection of Jesus. All four culminate there. All right? Uh, if you wanted to add one more at the bottom... This is the one I should put in here in a revised edition. In the Gospels and all the New Testament, there is a strong and active presence of the demonic. There is a very strong and active presence of the demonic. Why? Is it there in the Old Testament? Yes, yeah, so already it lets us know that there's going to be a battle with Satan, the evil, against the Messiah. So that kind of tells it. Uh, who, who is there inciting God with Job? Satan. Satan. Who incites David to take a census to show how great his kingdom is? It says Satan put that in David's heart. So he's there all through the First Testament. Uh, but why all of a sudden would it be very strong presence in the Gospels and the New Testament? Like show that Jesus was able to fight against him? Yeah, this is the one. You know, this, this is the Genesis 3.15. All right, we are going to put everything we have into stopping this now. All right, or we are in eternal trouble. So it all fits together as well with his increased presence and activity uh, in the ministry of Jesus. Okay? All right. Let's go to Matthew. Uh, have your Bibles ready. We'll get to them uh, in a minute here. What do we know about Matthew? Uh, first, the synoptic gospels there at the top. If you hear that term, what does synoptic gospels mean? Uh, very top of your page 63, the synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke not John, they reflect many similarities to each other in contrast to John's gospel, which provides a different yet complementary picture of Jesus. Uh, in all likelihood, scholars agree that Mark was probably written first, because there are things in Mark that definitely Matthew and Luke borrow. Uh, not fully, because they each have their own slant, but that they do borrow, and there's parallels in those three. So there are things in Matthew and Luke that are in Mark that aren't necessarily in Matthew and Luke. So that leads them to say, yes, Mark probably was written first of the three. Uh, but again, that doesn't change anything. That's just kind of for our own information. So let's look at the gospel according to Matthew. What do we know about Matthew? He was a tax collector. So what was his whole life? He dealt with money. How do you think that could influence his gospel when he writes? It's to be balanced. Let's take a look at a couple things that are unique to Matthew. Uh, oh, where do we start? Go to, I think it's Matthew 17. Matthew 17, 24. Go Matthew 17, 24. Matthew 17, 24. This is the temple tax. All right? So when they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the half shekel, so there's a something there too. It's a half shekel tax. 
went up to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the tax? Who's a teacher? Jesus, isn't he not going to pay the temple tax, the half shekel? All right, look what Jesus, Peter says, yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to Peter first, saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. How much temple tax would a full shekel pay? Two. Look at the next one. Jesus said, take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. He's the only gospel writer that includes that story. Why might that have stuck to Matthew? Deals him with money. <laughs> oh my goodness, Peter caught this fish and there was a shekel in its mouth. It covered Peter's cover charge and mine. Jesus cover charge. You know, I mean that that stuck in his mind, that the, the money aspect of it there. Uh, go to Matthew, let me see, 26, I'm thinking. Matthew 26, verse 14. 26, 14. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I deliver Jesus over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment, Judas sought an opportunity to betray him, Jesus. Uh, Matthew's the only one that says it's 30 pieces of silver. Why? That would have stuck out to him. The, the other ones say he betrayed for money, but he's the only one that puts the detail in there, 30 pieces of silver. So again, you see his life is being influencing, flavoring, is probably a better word, flavoring his gospel. Uh, in Matthew 2, He's the only one that records the visit of the Magi. Uh, the other ones do not. What might have really impressed Matthew about, yeah, gold, <laughs> frankincense, and three very expensive, costly gifts. So again, you see this beautiful thread that's connected to his life, kind of flavoring the entire gospel uh, from his own perspective as a tax collector who Jesus called, like the worst of the worst, Jesus called to come into his kingdom and follow him, and even be one of the twelve. Uh, so it's, it's a beautiful thing uh, to kind of take each of them on, and we'll do this for the other ones as well. Okay? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, there's a much more Jewish slant in Matthew's gospel as he is the one from the Old Testament. We'll look at that as we unpack it underneath. So if you have a Jewish person who is considering Jesus as the Messiah and open to it, uh, that would be a very good gospel to have that person read first uh, because he's from a Jew who was called to confess Jesus as the Messiah and come in as well. Here's some other highlights. Uh, he's the only one that includes the new and old treasures. Uh, story as well as the laborers' wages. So again, you kind of see this flavoring his gospel. Uh, but let's look on your notes there, your syllabus, page 63. You can break Matthew's gospel into a very simple three-part outline as you're reading it. As you go through it, you're like, wow, he, he probably really did this uh, intentionally. Uh, first part to 416 is really focusing on the person of Jesus Christ. So as you're reading that part, look for those clues that is declaring who this is. All right, who is this? All right, then when you get to the next section, uh, it's really focusing on Jesus' work. What is he here to do? So who is he, and now what is he here to do? And then the last section of the gospel there, 
what's his destiny? If that's who he is, and this is what he's here to do, where's that going to take him? What's his path, his destiny? Uh, so focus on the destiny of Jesus Christ. How does Matthew portray Jesus, the chief character in his gospel? Uh, first one there, he's an authoritative teacher. Already in Matthew 7, after his Sermon on the Mount, it says they are amazed at his teaching with authority, blown away by it. Uh, second one, he portrays Jesus as the Son of God. At his baptism in Matthew 3, God declares, This is my Son, whom I am well pleased, or whom I love. All right, Satan then, once he hears, This is the one. What's he do? Matthew 4, 3. If you are the Son of God. All right, that's who he's going to go attack. Now, everyone, all the demons, here we go. Focus on this guy. All right? He just was declared the Son of God. Boom. Next chapter, here comes Satan. Try to get him to fall from that. Uh, the Father, again, in the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my Son whom I love. Listen to him. Uh, third one, he's portrayed as the suffering servant. Remember Isaiah 53 and the four servant songs? Matthew's saying this is the one, right? It's a direct, perfect match. Uh, he's healed. He, he heals the ill and the demon possessed in 8.17. He is quiet. He does not open his mouth in Matthew 27.12 on his way to the cross. He is mocked, stripped, and spit on in 27 to 31. This is the one Isaiah foretold. Uh, he's also broad category, then the other ones are the specifics. He's the goal and fulfillment of all of Israel's history and its major figures. All right? So he is Moses. He is the greater Moses. And Sermon on the Mount. This is he was on, uh, on the Mount of uh, Jesus. Sermon on the Mount. He's Elijah. Uh, Elijah was known for his prophetic call to repentance. Jesus' first sermon, repent, the kingdom of heaven is here. Uh, who are you? Some say you are Elijah. All right? Transfiguration. Who was there with Jesus? Moses and Elijah. So he's the long-awaited Elijah uh, that the Old Testament spoke of. Underneath that, he's also the son of David. <laughs> Look at how many times, right away in verse 1, this is the son of David. That takes you back to what in the First Testament? 2 Samuel 7, the promise of the king, David's eternal descendant. Look how many times, son of David, son of David, son of David, son of David. This is the one. All right, Matthew's saying to the Jewish people, Next one, he's also God's people themselves. Remember how Abraham went down to Egypt, lied about Sarah, his wife. Uh, God plagued them. Abraham came out with a bunch of possessions. The Egyptian, or the Israelites are called children of God, sons of God. They go down to Egypt. God plagues Pharaoh. They come out with a bunch of possessions. What does Jesus do? He goes down to Egypt until King Herod dies and comes out of there and goes back. So he is the children of God, the faithful son of God who returns. He's tempted for 40 days, all right, just like the Israelites were. He's addressed as God's son, uh, just as God addresses the Israelites. Though that his son of God in the Old Testament, the Israelites failed. This son of God would get it. For them. So he would be the faithful son of God. All right, and then finally, who is Jesus at the bottom? He's the Lord himself. Yahweh himself. All right, he does what the scripture says the Lord will do. <laughs> All right, he forgives sins. He heals the blank. He heals the blind. He heals the lame. He heals the deaf. He heals the leper. He raises the dead. He provides for the poor. All those things that the Old Testament said Yahweh himself would do, Jesus does. Exodus, or Ezekiel 34, God said, I myself will shepherd my people. What does Jesus do? He is the shepherd. So he is, again, literally Yahweh himself 
in the flesh. Uh, so that is how Matthew's trying to write uh, to the Jewish people there. Any questions on Matthew before we move on to Mark? Okay. Lengthwise, Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels. Well, Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience to convince them that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. Uh, Matthew was a first-hand eye account. Mark is writing to Christians in Rome in the 60s who are suffering very very strong persecution. Uh, so he has a complete different audience. Uh, in the Gospel of Mark, uh, there's the theme of misunderstanding. It's in spades. No one gets Jesus. Uh, the crowds don't get him. The religious leaders don't get him. Even his own disciples do not get him. All right, it's just one of the big things. So there might have been a temptation if you were one of those first century Christians in Rome being persecuted, you might have been tempted to say, if only I were there, if only I could have seen Jesus, I would have gone, I would have been there with my own eyes. It would have helped me now in my struggles, my persecution. Mark's writing saying, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> Religious leaders didn't get it. They were there. The crowds didn't get it. They were there. His own disciples didn't get it. And they were there. So you know what? You probably wouldn't have gotten it either. All right? So you don't have to think that you only I would have been there. Then I would have gotten it to help me through this. Uh, and we'll look at who the first person of the gospel of Mark is to get it. It's not one you would expect. It's probably one of the least ones you would expect who, who gets it. All right? Again, in Mark, there's a very strong active presence of the demonic. Very strong. Okay? What do we know about the gospel of Mark at the top? Mark was a companion of Paul. And a follower of Peter. He was not one of the 12 disciples. But he knew Paul. He went with him. And a follower of Peter. Who was the lead of the disciples. So who did he get his information from? Well the Holy Spirit. But Peter the leader of the 12. And then Paul who saw Jesus himself. So he's backed by two very very credible sources. Uh, so we don't have to die. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, if you look at Mark as a book itself, it's kind of like a drama written out in three acts. And this is just some of the amazing ingenuity of the Gospels as works of literature themselves, not just as 100% Holy Scripture. Uh, there's a heading. It announces who Jesus Christ is, the Son of God. And then we get this prologue that sets up the whole scene as the rest of the Gospels going to play out. Act 1. Starts off with Jesus' ministry in and around Galilee. In Act 2, Jesus is on the road to Jerusalem. And then in Act 3, his fate is played out there. Uh, and it's amazing how this all just characterizes this entire gospel. Distinctive Mark's traits about Mark. There's no birth narrative. <laughs> he jumps right in with John the Baptist. Skips the whole narrative, Christmas thing. Uh, it's not there in Mark. Uh, there's also, and we'll get to this at the end. I think I'll get to this at the end. Uh, there's no post-resurrection appearance of Jesus narrated in what we call Mark's short ending. Uh, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Turn to Mark. It's got to be 15 or 16. Let me punt it. It's got to be 15. Mark 15, doo -doo -doo, everyone's mocking him on the cross. 33, there's darkness from noon to 3. My God, my God. Yes, 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 yes. Here we go. Look at verse 38 and 39. All right, so Jesus has just died on the cross in front of everybody. All the disciples left him. All right, they gone. All right, uh, and we'll get to that in just a little bit as well. Uh, look at 38 39. As soon as he died, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Not from the bottoms up. From the top down. Uh, some estimates are that that curtain weighed 300 pounds. Very fine, tightly woven linen. 
There's no way uh, that man could have just done that, especially from the top down. Uh, so that itself is an act of God, signaling who this guy is. All right, that 300-pound curtain just ripped from the top to bottom, which also signifies it's coming from the top, God, down. All right, but here we go. We really want to look at uh, 39. And when the centurion, who is a centurion? Roman soldier. So here's a Roman soldier at the foot of the cross. When he stood facing Jesus, saw that in this way Jesus breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. Who's the first one who gets it in all of Mark's gospel? A Roman soldier. Who is he writing to? Christians in Rome. <coughs> the disciples don't get it. The women don't get it. The religious leaders, chief priests and Pharisees don't get it. The crowds don't get it. The thieves next to him don't get it. The first person who gets it in all of the gospel is at the cross by a Roman soldier. Because this is the Son of God. It's the only explanation that can be for this. He really is who he says. Uh, amazing. Uh, and by the way, Mark tells you, verse 1-1, one, one, who this is. <laughs> All right? And that's kind of the punchline of the whole gospel. Jesus tells the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. No one gets that. Until the cross, Roman soldier. Ah, Son of God. Okay? Uh, how does... Let me see what else I had up here. So the Christians in Rome in 80 under heavy persecution, if only we had been there, no, they wouldn't have gotten it either. No human gets it except for one. Um, he's kind of odd. Did I have this in here? Yeah, we'll get to this in a little bit. So hang on to that last one. Here we go. How does Mark portray Jesus? Your notes there halfway through. Again, a man of commanding authority. 118, follow me. Right? I will make you fishers of men. Boom, they drop everything and follow him. Uh, commands the demon to come out. Immediately it comes out. This word immediately in Mark's gospel occurs 42 times. Immediately this. Immediately this. Jesus said this. Immediately this happened. Jesus healed this. Immediately the sickness was gone. All right? So very commanding authority in Mark's gospel. 42 times immediately is used in relation to Jesus. Second one down, he's also a man of power. <laughs> so he's cluing us into who this Jesus is, a man of incredible power. Underneath that, he has power over disease. 134, he heals Peter's mother-in-law. So he was married. He had a wife, all right? Uh, I kind of wonder that with the whole Pope thing not being married when Peter himself says had a mother-in-law that Jesus healed, meaning he was married. Did, Peter, did Jesus make Peter get a divorce to follow him and be the chief disciple? No. So I always wondered about that, uh, with that teaching. Uh, he heals this woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. All right, his power over disease. Uh, second one down, he's got power over nature. Uh, he calms the wind and the waves. Even they obey him, the disciples say. Third one down, he has power over food or elements. Uh, there's two feedings, one to 5,000, and then in chapter 8, the feeding of the 4,000, both miracles, all right? So if he has power over food, could he also have power over bread and wine? All right, yes, absolutely, there's a connection there. Fourth one, he also has power over demons. All right, are you here to destroy us? In chapter 5, what is your name? Legion, for we are many. A Roman legion could have as many as like 6,000 foot soldiers in it. So when the demon answers, we are legion, <laughs> all right, how many are in this man? Could be thousands of demons. So Jesus cast them into pigs? First instance in the Bible of deviled ham, right? And they run off a cliff and drown themselves. 
<laughs> okay? So even the demonic flee at Jesus' word. Uh, add a fifth one over in the column. That's another revision, I have to, or another one I have to put in there. He also has power over death. Uh, chapter 5 and chapter 16. Uh, his own death, uh, as well as raising others. So he's, he's got the power. You got the power. He's also oddly in Mark's gospel. The next one down, he's a man to be feared. The demons fear him. Have you come to destroy us? <laughs> they know it's coming. All right, who he is. They don't have a question. They're the only other ones in Mark's gospel that get it. They know exactly who Jesus is. All right, after he casts the demons into the pigs and they drown, those people ask him to leave. <laughs> Would you just kind of move on to the next village, please? All right, they're scared uh, of who this guy is and his power. Under that is a man who is divine. Uh, demon, I know who you are. Right, son of God. Centurion, right, you are certainly this man was the son of God. So Mark's saying he's not just powerful man. He's divine. This is God. All right. Under that, he's also a man who is truly human. In Mark 3, he is angry. <laughs> Very human characteristic. In chapter 5, he loses power. It says Jesus feels power go out of him. Uh, so Mark also accents his full human nature, that he was man, born of the Virgin Mary. Uh, in Mark 6, it says he's actually at one point not able to do anything, <laughs> right? Again, emphasizing his full human nature. Uh, and then in 825, it takes Jesus two tries to heal a blind man. Uh, so again, Mark's not bashful about this full human nature of Jesus, uh, divine and human at the same time. Uh, next one there, he's also a man who is very odd. Uh, chapter 1, he heals the lepers and then just takes off. <laughs> he gets out of Dodge. It's kind of strange. Uh, look at Mark 6.48. Go to Mark chapter 6.48. If you have the ESV translation, it will bring this out the best. The other ones are there, but the ESV is a little closer on this one. So this is when Jesus goes walking on the water, Mark 6, 48. So I'll start at verse 47. Uh, he goes up on a mountain to pray, verse 47. When evening came, the boat was out on the sea, on the galley. So Jesus was alone on the land. And so he saw that they were, so he saw them from an incredible distance. Uh, so again, he's, we're always in view. He always knows his disciples and where they are at. Uh, he he saw they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, all right, between 3 and 6 a.m., middle of the night, dark, 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 all right? Remember, they didn't have street lights back then to light up the sky. About the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. All right? Here's ESV translation. He meant to pass by them. That's odd. That's literally what it says. Jesus came to them and meant, meant to just keep right on walking. See you guys. All right, good luck with the wind. <laughs> All right? <laughs> uh, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. Uh, Mark calls out his intention was to just walk right by him. Why would he do that? I don't know. It's just Mark's odd, you know, unique feature here and so forth. Uh, go to 1114. Mark eleven fourteen. So again, his humanity here, we're told that he was hungry. So Jesus was hungry. Uh, verse 13, and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. So he was going to eat a fig, fig fruit. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. So he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. <laughs> he curses a fig tree that doesn't have fruit on it because it's not in season. All right, so again, it's just Mark saying, you know, a little odd at times as well. Stuff that they would have remembered and passed on and 
and written down here. Uh, and then finally, very bottom there, he was also a man who was forsaken. He's forsaken by his disciples in 1450. They all desert him. Uh, one of them is running away, and his like cloak gets grabbed, and it says it pulls it right off. So it's like there's this naked man running. Uh, if you want to turn, we're almost there anyway. Turn to Mark 1450. And the big question is, who's this young man running away naked from the garden? Uh, so look at verse 49. Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching. You did not seize me. Uh, so they're coming up to seize Jesus and lead him to be tried. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. So all the disciples abandoned Jesus. And verse 51, a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. They seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Uh, who's this young man? Some wonder if it was Mark, John Mark here. We don't know for sure, uh, but it's just another interesting detail in his gospel that's kind of out there. Uh, so there's even... Uh, nudity. It kind of reminds me of Isaiah and Isaiah 20 running naked, but I don't think there's a connection there at that point. It's just one of those interesting details. And, and who was that? All right. Uh, let's close in just a couple minutes here. Uh, look at in your Bibles. Go to Mark 16. Does anyone's Bible say anything down? Between verse 8 and verse 9. Yeah. What does it say? Some of our best reliable biblical pieces and scrolls going back. The earliest ones do not have 9 to 20 in them. All right. And if you read Mark 9, 16, 9 to 20, uh, the sentence structure is not like Mark. The vocabulary is not like Mark. The word choices and stuff are not like Mark. Uh, so according to the earliest, our best evidence that we have, where did Mark stop his gospel? Verse 8. All right. Look at verse 7 and 8. Why would... Others have felt the need to keep writing <laughs> and not leave the gospel at verse 8. All right, look at verse 7. Uh, but go, so this is at the resurrection, the, the angel, but go tell his disciples and Peter that Jesus is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So these are to the women. And they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And gospel. Why would they have felt the need to keep writing? Mm -hmm. And how did it end? It ends with the women scared, not saying anything to anyone. All right, but what did, what did the angel say? Go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going before you into Galilee. All right, go to Mark 14, 28. Go a couple days before to Mark 14, 28. Start verse 26, so the Last Supper, when they had sung a hymn, so Jesus' disciples sang a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. We saw that happen in verse 50. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But look at verse 28. But after I am raised, I will go before you into Galilee. So what's the angel say? Go where he told you he'd find you. He will be in Galilee waiting for you. He's alive. Now, go tell disciples to go. All right? What about for the reader? Where do we find Jesus in Galilee? 
Go to chapter 1. So after this introduction of John the Baptist, look at 1 verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. What's Mark doing to the reader? He's alive. He's risen. Go to Galilee. There you will find him. So now that the reader knows who Jesus is, the Roman soldier told them, he's the son of God. Jesus said, I'll be in Galilee. The angel said, go to Galilee. Where do you find Jesus in Galilee? Go back to chapter 1. Now that you know who he is, go back to the beginning and read it again. All right? And you'll see the clarity now of who I've been trying to tell you all along who he is. But no one got except a Roman soldier. Now that you know, go back to Galilee, chapter 1, and read it again. It's brilliant, brilliant work of literature and art, <laughs> and that on Mark's part. Uh, so is that, are we saying, though, that the other words there uh, did not happen or were not told by Jesus? No, we're just saying those weren't for Mark. All right, as other stuff was passed on orally and stuff. But if you read even Mark uh, 16, 12, all right, this is, they're getting this right from Luke. <laughs> After those things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. That's the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. Uh, and they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. So they just kind of summarized Luke, put that in there, and then kind of did this. So you kind of see it. But Mark itself would have ended it at verse 8 in all likelihood. But it doesn't say, it doesn't change anything. It's, that's his masterful writing. Now that you know, hey, go back and read it again. He's in Galilee. That's right where you'll find it. Okay? Any questions on that? I can't wait to do the other two. Luke also has an amazing perspective. I'll have to leave you hanging there, though, until until next Wednesday. Uh, again, I saw something, I noticed something again this morning that I had never noticed about Luke that is unique to Luke. It's just like, wow. Um, so we'll get to those of you seen Matthew and Mark's flavor. Now we'll see Luke's next week and John. Uh, so there's, there's even a potential that we could finish next week. Um, so we'll, we'll see. We're very close now. We're very, very close. All right, hey, let's close with a prayer. Lord God, again, we just give you thanks that you are a faithful God. You have sent your servant, Jesus, the Messiah, to die and rise. May that be our focus. May that be the focus of Trinity Church and school. And may all people come to the knowledge of the Roman centurion that truly from the cross we see him as the Son of God. Bless us as we go our ways under your sovereign hand. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. The Lord be with you.